Well, how are we doing, ladies? We, uh, did anybody, is everybody digesting, or are we, are we caffeinated? Where are we at on that whole process? Uh, <laughs> hopefully we're, maybe, maybe we're doing both. Um, uh, I, I certainly am just encouraged by your appetite for the Word of God, and that, that, I'm not surprised by that today. That's just been evident um, throughout the church, and I'm very grateful for that. But I also know that, uh, that we got a lot, we're doing a lot together today. We're, we're, we're just diving in and we're running 100 miles an hour. So I appreciate your, your uh, endurance. I want to ask you to grab your Bibles and open up to 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter chapter 3, and this is um, a classic text, of course. Um, this is a text that I've, I've spent a lot of time in um, just by way of counseling over the years, uh, 15 years in college ministry, uh, you know, premarital is just a regular uh, part of my life, so, you know, this is a, a go-to text, and, and it's a go-to text in marital counseling, and it's a go-to text for, um, for uh, my, my own heart, and as April and I uh, live life, and it's just a classic text, and so I'll, I'll just prepare you this, this afternoon that to this session, this third session, is probably going to maybe sound a little bit more like a um, group counseling. So it's more of a conversation as we walk through this text, and we want to bring it to bear in a way that is helpful. And this text does a lot for us, and one of the things that it does is it helps us to kill sinful fear. I remember one of those instances, uh, I mean, several years ago, about a decade now, a young couple came over to, uh, to our house, to April and I, our house. We had a few boys at the time, and it was after an e- evening service uh, on a Sunday night, and this young couple comes into our home, and, and they had, had, had some tension in their marriage and some typical conflict, typical disagreements, and typical arguing and confusion, and, and they were just a young couple, and it was just a typical, typical conversation, and just the way that that goes. And so we started helping them. We opened up the scriptures, and it was very clear that uh, they would be encouraged and benefit from just um, maybe a, a combination of refreshing in some of the basics of marriage, uh, but also advancing in some of their understandings of how that works together and the dynamic and the roles and all that, all that goes into that. So we start, we start walking through, you know, and those kind of conversations uh, can take, you know, weeks and months and they can, you know, they, it, it just takes, takes a lot of time. You got to work through and just, you know, see where your thinking is not biblical and that just takes a lot of time. This is a particularly bright couple. The, the young man was in seminary. The, the wife was very sharp. And we just start, we were kind of working at breakneck speed and just working through some things. And they were just listening. And, and I remember getting through some, some serious charges and exhortations to her and just to, to encourage her and say, hey, here's, some, here's, some, here's an avenue where you can see a, a forward advance in this particular uh, dynamic that you're facing, this particular challenge in your marriage. And um, she kind of had this, I remember this, there's, there's this look on her face. It was kind of like, a, I don't know, maybe a combination between dehydration and sickness. Uh, I didn't know what to make of it. And so I was just looking, I just paused. And I'm like, I'm like so um, tell, me, tell me what you're thinking. I want, I want to hear your thoughts on that. And she just paused and uh, didn't, she didn't really move at first. And then she kind of just gan- cl- cast a glance over at her husband and she just said, that sounds terrifying. I'd explained to her 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 calling, her role to submit to her husband, and she started to explain why that sounded so, so startling. It was a terrifying fear because uh, there just had been some trust that had been broken down, Uh, the trust that she would have wanted to be there, but it wasn't there. And yet, nevertheless, this is God's calling on her life, and so now, where do you go? Who do you trust? And what's interesting about this text, this text is so helpful for us, and I, I know it's familiar to you ladies, but what I love about this text, one of my favorite things about the text is, as you'll often, just like I, we saw in Matthew 6, it's the conjunction, in the same way. Ladies, if you want to kill sin, you have an example in Jesus Christ. If you want to kill sinful fear, you have an example in Jesus Christ. And that's where this passage starts. Because it starts in the same way, and then it says, you wives. And then verse 7 says, you husbands, in the same way. And so this in the same way is governing both discussions, what Peter says to the husbands and what Peter says to the wives. But as you know, the, the, the in the same way then is tying both of them now back to the previous example, which is none other than the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So let's go back. We've got to begin in chapter 2. 
especially, um, let's pick it up in verse 20. Peter is talking to this, these, these saints who are suffering. They are suffering unjustly under pagan rulers, uh, pagan dominions, abuse of authority. Um, and he's describing the, the virtue and the value of suffering for righteousness. But obviously, if you disobey the law and you're a lawbreaker and you suffer for it, there's no reward there. But he's explaining to these Christians what a, what a good uh, a privilege that is to, for them to suffer for the sake of doing righteousness. And so he says in verse 20, what credit is there if when you sin and are harshly treated, you endure it with patience? You know, it's like the person who gets pulled over for going 20 over and like, oh, it's because I had a fish, a fish on my bumper sticker. Christian, Christian bumper sticker, that's why he pulled me over. No, it's probably because you're going 20 over. But if when you do what is right and you suffer for it and you patiently endure it, this finds favor with God. This is where P, uh, Peter points to Christ as the example. Verse 21, you've been called for this purpose. Since Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example to follow in his footsteps, who committed no sin, nor was any deceit found in his mouth. And by, while, while being reviled, he did not revile in return. While suffering, he uttered no threats, but kept entrusting himself to him who judges righteously. Think about that for a second, ladies. Christ, if anyone has ever had the right to complain about abuse of authority, it was Christ. He was perfect, unindictable for any charge. They reviled him, they mocked him, they made up charges. It was a kangaroo court, and he said nothing. What did he do, though? According to verse 23, he kept entrusting himself, Jesus Christ, to him, God the Father, him who judges justly. He knows, I'm leaving this in God's hands. He's under an authority that is wicked, perverse, abusing authority, abusing justice, perpetrating it on him, and he said nothing. This is righteousness on display. I mean, he, he literally, he's unindictable, and so they have to make up the charges, and when they start mocking him, he doesn't even say anything in return. What's profound about Christ's example here is, imagine, imagine what Christ could have accomplished if he had taken matters into his own hands. I mean, this is kind of a rebuke to us, when we try to take matters into our own hands, because we actually can't accomplish anything. But this is Christ. I mean, all he has to do is open his mouth, offer a defense, and it's over. I mean, this is the individual who has the power to sustain creation with his word. He created the world. He created the people who are charging him. He can, he's sustaining their very existence as they're abusing him. And this is unreal, the irony unfolding as Jesus is being falsely accused and he's saying nothing in return. Verse 24, And he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. For by his wounds you were healed. For you were continually strained like sheep, but now you have returned to the shepherd and guardian of your souls. Christ suffered all of this, and he endured all of this because he entrusted himself to his Father who judges righteously. He did not take any judgment into his own hands. He did not rely on him himself at all. He just simply entrusted, moves forward in faith, does not revile, does not respond, doesn't do anything to avoid the horrific circumstances of being crucified unjustly on the cross, and he did this to love us while we were straying like sheep. And so now in the same way, ladies, you have a charge given to you. You have a charge to do something similar. And the example of Christ, it becomes your example, particularly when it comes to killing fear. I mean, you think about all that Jesus could have been tempted by with regard to 
fear, because he was tempted in every way as we are, but yet he was without sin. And he put fear to death by entrusting himself to his father. So, ladies, let's dive in. We've got to ask the question of this text, how do I kill sinful fear in my life? And um, you're going you're gonna to see an outline here on the, I think, I think we got it. Um, first four verses and the second two ver- last two verses unfold in, in, with doing two different things. So first of all, Peter just explains how critical it is to submit to God-given authority in our lives. Submitting to God-given authority in your life is the preeminent way you kill sinful fear in your life. To the degree that you rely on yourself to avoid the circumstances that you so desperately want, you are going to feed fear. To the degree that you submit to God-given authority, to that degree you kill fear. Let's dive in, verse 1. In the same way, you wives... Be submissive to your own husbands, so that even if any of them are disobedient to the word, they may be won without a word by the behavior of their wives, as they observe your chaste and respectful behavior. In these first two verses, Peter is showing us that, you know, ladies, your submission is actually beneficial to others. It highlights even how beneficial your submission is even to your husband's. And so, as we walk through this, I I understand I'm I'm actually asking one simple question. How do I kill sinful fear in my life? And this is part of it. Part of it is even realizing the value of submission. It certainly kills fear, but it also benefits your husband. So, let's look at what he says here. Be submissive to your own husbands, so that even if any of them are disobedient to the word. Now, let me make a quick comment here. Uh, this can go a couple of different ways. I've heard people describe this as a, a moment where maybe a husband or an authority, right? it, could, it could be government, it could be elders, it could be any, an employer, uh, but any of the circumstances where you find yourself in a, in a sphere under authority, it could be uh, applied maybe in this context of where in that particular decision being made, it's disobedient to the word. And, and I, would, I would grant that that could be an application of it, but I don't, that's not the, the, the focus of, of the word here. Uh, The word is not your typical word for disobedience, and that could go either way. It is the classic word for being unpersuaded. It's talking about categorically, if your husband is in a category of not being persuaded by the word. This is somebody who, you're under authority, and that authority does not find the word compelling. They're not persuaded by it. It doesn't weigh in on how they make decisions. And so now you can see this is a recipe for fear because now all of a sudden you find yourself in a position under authority and the authority who has the right and the, and the, and the, and the, the prerogative to weigh in on what's going to affect your life is not constrained by the word. Yikes. Even if, even if, They are disobedient to the word, or maybe even more literal, unpersuaded by the word. I want you to be submissive to them so that they may be one without a word. It's a powerful charge. It's a powerful charge because when you submit to ungodly authority because God called you to, You cannot be more like Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ submitted to ungodly authority without complaint. Though reviled, he did not revile in return. He remained silent. And so you say, but I can't trust. What if I can't trust the authority? Well, do you? Do you trust God? He told you to submit to Imperfect authority? God's here telling us to submit to God-given authority. And to wives, even to submit to a husband, even if they're in a category of not finding the word compelling, but your submission to your husband is actually the compelling uh, presentation of Christ to your husband. And that's why he says, so that they may be one without a word by the behavior of 
their wives. Uh, wives have, for, throughout the history of the church, as we're going to see in verses 5 and 6, throughout the history of, of mankind, wives have had such a powerful, powerful influence on society, on the church, on husbands, and on children. And obviously the scriptures talk about this. Let me show you one quick cross-reference, just so it's fresh in your minds. Remember what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 7? He talks about the spiritual influence of a believer on a spouse, even a spouse who's not a believer. And in verse, in 1 Corinthians 7, verse 14, Paul says, for the unbelieving husband is sanctified through his wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified through her believing husband. For otherwise your children are unclean, but now they are holy. And of course, this isn't talking about the, the presence of salvation in the home somehow magically, supernaturally saving everyone else in the home, but it certainly is a means of grace to set apart that home for the purposes of truth and for the purposes of righteousness so that even children with one believing parent actually are set apart in a degree from a perverse and a, a culture around them with godly influence. And that's even a benefit on an unbelieving husband and a believing husband on an unbelieving wife. So there's a powerful, powerful influence here. Peter gives us even more specific instruction, particularly on, on this direction when the wife is the believer and the husband is not persuaded by the word, that it's your calling to win your husband without a word. Now, I know this doesn't apply to everyone in the room. It applies to some of you. And regardless, this is a benefit to think about uh, because of what Peter's instructing us, and it actually helps us as the church even to help out other sisters in Christ, regardless of our circumstance. But Peter is specifically addressing sisters in Christ whose husbands are not persuaded by the word, and he says, win them without a word, by your behavior. So, let me just, I, I made a list, several things that Peter does not mean by winning your husband without a word. He's not saying that women should never say anything, uh, as if you should never um, speak any word that could possibly be construed as a confrontation. You're, you're called. You know, if you have a, especially, especially this gets really complicated in circumstances where in a marriage you have a wife who's str striving to walk with the Lord and a husband who professes to walk with the Lord, but their lifestyle is exposed by the scriptures. I'm not talking about, you know, an imperfect walk. I mean, we all, we all have imperfect walks. I'm talking about someone whose lifestyle is says suspect. Is this person even following the Lord? Is there fruit? This, this, this life seems to be contradictory to the gospel. In that kind of situation, if they're professing to be a believer, well, then you would be unfaithful if there is, n if, if that, if, if a husband was unaware that a believing spouse was concerned Honey, are you even walking with the Lord? So it's not saying that you can never say anything. Because certainly, if somebody's professing to follow Christ, and they're living a lifestyle that is undermining the gospel, and that person doesn't even know that you would disapprove, well then, you've got to be faithful to the Scriptures. And that doesn't mean every time there's an inconsistency that you're bringing it back up and nagging and haranguing, but there does have to be clear articulation of, hey, you know, I'm not sure we've talked about this, but I, I'm, I'm concerned. Like, if that's never happened, well, then you've got to ask, am I being faithful to the Lord to confront a brother in sin? He's professing to be a believer. Matthew 18, 15 requires me to confront. He's also not saying that... Um, women whose husbands profess to be believers. Um, sh oh, I'm sorry, I already dealt, th dealt with that there. Um, he's also not saying that um, women should never take, area, take initiative in areas where God has called parents to obey. And sometimes as a, a wife with a, a husband who's not persuaded by the word, it might be tempting to think, oh, am, am, I, am I usurping authority if I go ahead and raise the children in the fear and admonition of the Lord? Because my husband's not. Well, now you're obeying the Lord, right? You're obeying the Lord. So if you, if you mention to your husband, hey, you know what? I'm going to keep teaching them the truth, and, you know, and, you, you, and, and he's okay with that, then it's great. You know, now you can just run, and you, you're, not, you're not violating the command to be silent because you're taking some initiative in obedience to Christ. 
He also doesn't mean that you wouldn't say anything if his leadership is going to require you to disobey Christ to submit to his leadership. It doesn't mean that you wouldn't speak up at that point and say, you know what, I can, I'll, I'm going to submit to all of your leadership in every area, I'll die to every preference, but when you require this of me, and that's a violation of God's word, I, I, have, to, I have to obey Christ. And so there's several things that it does not mean. However, it's very important that we realize that it, there's some things he is saying here. First of all, he, Peter's calling women to win their husbands by their actions. Ladies, it's easier to talk than to model. In all of your zeal to influence your husbands, channel that energy into living such an irreproachable life that for him to speak poorly of you would require him to blaspheme Christ or to reproach Christ. He's also encouraging you to never lecture your husband by beating him down with Bible references or theology to try to persuade him to act the way that you want him to act. Even if your husband is a self-deceived hypocrite, don't disobey this verse. You can never turn your desire for your husband's spiritual influence into hounding, manipulation, or nagging. Do, do not ever imagine that your nagging your husband is going to fill in the gaps for what the Spirit is apparently not doing in your husband's life. Instead, win him with your behavior. As they observe your chaste and um, qu uh, respectful behavior, literally, observing your pure lifestyle with fear, as you live your lifestyle with fear or in fear, there's a reverence for God, there's, a, there's an esteem for God, and, and that, that, that's what constrains you as you make these decisions. As, as husbands see that, that becomes a compelling ministry to a husband. Your submission benefits others, and also your submission kills your own fear. Look at verses 3 and 4. Verse 3 and 4. Your adornment must not be merely external, braiding the hair, wearing gold on dresses, but let it be the hidden person of the heart. Okay, we'll finish that verse in just a second. But the contrast here is not being adorned by externals, but being adorned by the internals, the, the character, the hidden person, your heart. I want to quickly make a textual comment here, because if you're reading, uh, probably several of you are reading the NAS, um, you heard me say the, uh, the phrase, your adornment must not be merely external, and you, if you're reading in NAS, you see the merely there. Merely is in italics, and that's a translational addition to try to smooth out something. And I, first of all, I, I can appreciate what they're doing here, so it's not like it's so totally misguided. I understand what they're doing here. The positive reason why you would add a merely here is because I think, I'm assuming, the translators are trying to avoid a potential confusion, which would be to think that Peter's actually prohibiting those things, as if, as if what Peter's doing is saying, don't wear braids and don't wear gold jewelry. Well, I mean, and, and honestly, it's, it's impossible that he's prohibiting those things because I, the last phrase, putting on dresses, is literally wearing garments. So he's obviously not prohibiting uh, braids and gold and getting dressed. <laughs> he's not prohibiting that. The, 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 the clear, what he's clearly doing, though, is he's prohibiting, not prohibiting those things in existence, he's prohibiting those things from becoming your adornment, which is a totally different command. And I actually think it's more clear to leave the merely out of it. He's actually, it's not just merely, he's saying that can't be your adornment. What beautifies you, ladies, must not be the externals. It's not wrong to have gold jewelry. It's not wrong to wear a braid. It's not wrong to wear, wear garments on Sunday morning. What's wrong is when that's what beautifies you. That's what you're known for as like, oh, this person, what, what beautifies them? What adorns them? What's, what, 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 really, what, what comes to mind when you think of them and you think, oh, man, they're a snappy dresser? Eh, that's probably not what we should be aiming at. What must adorn you is verse 4. Let it be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable quality 
of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is precious in the sight of God. Gentle. Here's a textbook definition pertaining to to not being overly impressed by a sense of one's self. That might not be the definition you were expecting. Sometimes we think of gentle and you think of kind and tender. And you think, uh, you know, somebody who's like a, a, a medical professional. You know, I remember one of my boys getting a pretty intense wound, and he had to have a lot and a lot of stitches. And he was very young, and I remember watching the nurse just so carefully clean the wound, thinking about, is he uncomfortable? Is he watching it? You know, and it was, it was, it was pretty massive. Stuff was coming out, and we were trying to, like, keep it all contained. And, 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 and she was amazing, just watching a professional do so well at just being very gentle in like that physical medical sense of the word. And sometimes we hear the word gentle and what comes to mind is something more like a personality, you know? And so sometimes even, you know, Anne, Anne made a comment, even made a joke about it. It's like, Anne's got a sense of humor. She's very outgoing. It's just like, hey, well, what happened to the quiet and gentle spirit? And sometimes we think about the quiet and gentle spirit and, and we think, well, I'm just, I'm just that's not my personality. No, that's, that actually must be your character. Who cares if it's your personality? One thing that's helpful about just looking at what this biblical or this text, textbook definition of gentle really is, when you think about not being impressed with your own self-importance, but humble, considerate, meek. Christ was meek, which meant he had power under control and he would not use that power for self-aggrandizement. I mean, this is... This is a, 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 demure, a demurring of yourself and a desire to not draw attention to yourself for any poor reason of, of selfish gain, selfish importance. And so it's helpful, actually, to remind ourselves, you know, this is not a personality issue. A gentle and quiet spirit isn't the personality that God gave you. And I, I think sometimes we get really confused about that. And, and I, I've seen that even in um, some of the young men that we train, and you, you, you watch them, and they're trying to figure out how to, how to counsel at times. And I remember some young seminary students kind of saying, like, you know, maybe sitting on one counseling meeting, and you're like, oh, that person was, uh, phew, they, they are unruly. They need to be admonished. I'd be like, well, how do you know? Like, did you hear like I talked? I mean, he's like just so over the top. He's so loud. He's drowning out his wife. He's like a bull in a china shop. He's just running around your office and you're, he's not even listening to a thing you're saying. I'm like, we'll see. We'll see. You know, I've been around a long, long time. I've, I've had people who when I've, I've confronted with truth, one man in particular, who I was convinced, I was actually watching his fist because I was speaking directly at his heart and he had just been exposed. And I literally thought he's coming across the desk after me. I'm walking out of here with a black eye at best. And wouldn't you know that Two, three months later, he was the most pliable, teachable man before the Lord. His personality was a bull in the china shop. But he heard truth and he listened. And I've watched the most timid, soft-spoken, mild-mannered, demurring personalities. Oh, yes, thank you, Pastor. I would never contradict anything you say. And three years later, they're still not listening to God's word. Oh, yes, I would never contradict. Well, you've been doing it for three years. This is not a personality trait. This is a character. It's a character. Quiet means quiet, well-ordered. In fact, in one, one, the adverb would mean pertaining to be quietly efficient. It's used in context with a word like service, and that would mean to carry out responsibility without commotion. And so there's an efficiency, there's a quietness, there's not a lot of chatter drawing attention to things. There's just a willingness to come under. That's a gentle and quiet spirit. I think you get the picture, but I'll give you a couple of illustrations. I remember one time um, I, was, I had to slip out of my office because I needed to get some studying done. It was a particularly busy day at the church that I used to serve at, and um, a lot were happening in the office, so I'd, I'd slip out, I'd walk down the, down the quarter mile down to the uh, Einstein Bagel. So I went into Einstein Bagels because I had a couple, couple hours, and so I just grabbed a couple books, and I was working on some things, and I had my, my earphones in, and, and all of a sudden I hear these ladies talking really loud. And I was kind of like, and it was just, something they said caught my ear, so I kind of hit pause, you know, and I'm listening. <laughs> what was that? Was that what I just hear? And you wouldn't believe they were going on and on and on about their husbands. 
They're no good, worthless, lazy, inappetent, uh, inept, just worthless husbands. Oh, your husband, oh yeah, well, my husband, and they're just outdoing one another in how lousy their husbands are. Just going back and forth, just the chatter, the complaining. Just there, there, were, there was a, a rage in their heart about their God-given authority. Contrast that with a friend I have who uh, faithfully buried her husband and then remarried, but her second husband was a spiritual fraud. And I remember watching her patience, her long-suffering, her willingness to sacrifice, serve, submit to a husband. It was exemplary. Eventually, he was disciplined out of the church, and she just remained faithful the whole time. You know, imagine she might have asked questions. Could this marriage ever be what I might want it to be? Can things change for the better? This woman proved that if it was going to get better, it was going to get better on God's terms. She was not about to take things into her own hands and make the marriage that she wanted. She was gentle and quiet. And I'm not talking about personality. I mean, she was somewhat of that personality-wise, but she was that in spades character-wise. Women who model verse 4 are a priceless commodity to a church because every church has women who can talk, but living godliness is much different. How do I kill sinful fear in my life? Submit to God-given authority. And remember, your submission benefits others. Your submission kills your own fear. The second way you kill sin and your sinful fear in your life is um, learning from biblical examples. Verses 5 and 6 give us biblical examples. Verse 5, generically, just about women from older ages. And then specifically in verse 6, Sarah. So we're going to take them one at a time. Verse 5, and I just summarized it this way. Women have always adorned themselves with submission. Women have always adorned themselves with submission. Look at verse 5. For in this way, in former times, the holy women also, who hoped in God, used to adorn themselves, being submissive to their own husbands. When you are trusting God, you submit to your own husband in spite of his spiritual leadership. When you do this because God told you to, well, then you demonstrate that you trust God implicitly. And this is what the women of old did, and this is what they were praised for. This should be your adornment. When women don't hope in God, then they fear. If you don't hope in God, it becomes impossible to not uh, sin by a fearful sinning, uh, by not trusting the Lord. You know, trusting God and fearful sinning are, are incompatible. You can't do both. Well, what are you afraid of? I can imagine in this circumstance, thinking about this passage, thinking about potential abuse of authority, thinking about questionable motives and maybe even documentable motives. You might not even be presuming to think these motives are horrible. I can imagine being afraid of, with these thoughts, my life's about to get more complicated if I submit. I'm going to suffer because of him or them or whatever the authority happens to be. I can't trust his leadership because he's self-absorbed. How about this? If I don't push back out of godly concern, then his selfishness will have no constraint. Or if I don't push back out of godly concern, then the whole direction of his life will fall into worldliness. If I lay down, there's no telling where his freedom will take him. Or let's bring the kids in. His influence might be negative on the kids. My daughters will be attracted to superficial attributes because the spiritual ones are absent. 
My sons will never understand what godly masculinity looks like. How can I not fear when my leader has never taken the time to understand me? In verse 5, Peter just points out that the holy women from old times, from the Old Testament specifically, as he's about to get to Sarah herself, they hoped in God. They placed all their hope in God, and they adorned their lives by submitting to their own husbands because God had told them to. They trusted God. They hoped in God. And they knew that whatever fears they might have, in fact, I just deliberately wrote those fears with this in mind, thinking some of these fears might actually be legitimate. So the question then becomes, what if my obedience puts me in circumstances that I'm trying to avoid? Yeah, that's where hoping in God comes in. Do you believe that perhaps undesirable circumstances might actually be for your spiritual best, for the spiritual best of your husband, and even for the spiritual best of your children? Do you believe God knows better than you what circumstances your family needs? And that's where fear starts to be killed, is right there at that moment where we crucify the notion that I know better than God what circumstances I need to maximize and which ones I need to avoid. I need to just obey. So, learn from biblical examples. Women have always adorned themselves with submission. And then secondly, look at verse 6. Sarah trusted God in the face of fear. Just as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, and you have become her children if you do what is right without being frightened by any fear. Now, this is a very simple verse, and it's very powerful. Probably the only thing I need to explain at all is what it means to call him Lord. Um, uh, <laughs> I, I, hope, I hope none of your husbands are asking you to call him Lord. Uh, but... <laughs> What that means is, it, it, you remember what Jesus says in Luke 6, 46, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and you do not do what I say? It, it's, it's a term of authority. And so the, the verse here is not saying, hey, follow in Sarah's footsteps because she used those four letters, let alone the, the English word. <laughs> it's not even that she called him Lord in that sense. It's that she called him Lord in the sense that she obeyed. So like, it's one thing to say, Jesus is my Lord. It's another thing that he actually is your Lord because you're actually obeying him and coming under his authority. So what this verse is saying is not, that's the label that she used for Abraham. It's that she actually submitted to his leadership. Well, yeah, of course she submitted to his leadership. I mean, Abraham's the patriarch. You know how easy she had it? You know, remember, let's not forget. Let's not forget how easy she had it. And so we're, gonna, we're, gonna, we're almost done here. I want to show you what, what, what Peter's getting at from Genesis 12 and Genesis 20, and we're going to wrap up with this. Let's look at Sarah's example, and this is going to really bring it home on how to kill sinful fear, because Sarah did not kill sinful fear because, well, she had such a great and godly husband. I mean, certainly, Abraham is the father of faith. Abraham was a believer, but appropriately, Peter is using two examples from Abraham and Sarah's life where Abraham is clearly not at his best. So in, in Genesis 12, let's pick it up in verse 10. Moses writes, Now there was a famine in the land, so Abram went down to Egypt to sojourn there, for the famine was severe in the land. It came about when he came near to Egypt that he said to Sarah, his wife, See now, I, I know that you are a beautiful woman, and when the Egyptians see you, they will say, This is his wife. And they will kill me, but they will let you live. So please say that you are my sister, so that it may go well with me because of you, and that I may live on account of you. It came about when Abraham came into Egypt, the Egyptians saw that the woman was very beautiful. Pharaoh's officials saw her and praised her to Pharaoh, and the woman was taken into Pharaoh's house. Therefore he treated Abram well for her sake, and gave him sheep and oxen and donkeys and male and male and female servants and female donkeys and camels but the lord struck pharaoh and put his uh, in his house with a great plague because of sarah 
Abram's wife. Then Pharaoh called Abram and said, what is this that you have done to me? Why did you not tell me that she was your wife? Why did you say, she's my sister, so that I took her for my wife? Now, here's your wife, take her and let her go. Pharaoh commanded his men concerning him, and they escorted him away with his wife and all that belonged to him. Abram's leadership in this moment is motivated by such a gross degree of self-preservation that he's willing to put his wife in harm's way. You think about what's happening here. Tell him you're my sister because I don't want to die. And then she gets shipped off to Pharaoh's palace. And they go, okay, well, now who's going to protect me here? Well, good thing it only happened once. <laughs> Turn over to Genesis 20. Verse 1, Abraham journeyed from there toward the land of the Negev and settled between Kadesh and Shur. Then he sojourned in Gerar. Abraham said of his Sarah, his, his wife, she's my sister. So Abimelech, king of Gerar, sent and took Sarah. But God came to Abimelech in a dream of the night and said to him, behold, you are a dead man because of the woman whom you have taken, for she is married. Now Abimelech had not come near her, and he said, Lord, will you slay a nation even though blameless? Did he not himself say to me, she's my sister? And she herself said, he's my brother? In the integrity of my heart and the innocence of my hands, I've done this. Then God said to him in the dream, Yes, I know that in the integrity of your heart you have done this, and I also kept you from sinning against me. Therefore, I did not let you touch her. Wow. Okay, pause right there for a second. Abram does it again. His leadership is so self-absorbed. I mean, like, Sarah, my goodness, like, what, what do you do at that point? Like, well, it, I was safe the first time. Let's, let's try out another pagan king and see how he does just gets shipped off. There he goes. It's like, I mean, you're like, she is left without any earthly security at all. There she is in Abimelech's palace. Well, good thing I got these guards with me. Wait, I mean, nothing. I mean, she has nothing to hang on, no crutch. What in the world was going through her mind? Well, first Peter tells us, she obeyed Abraham because she hoped in God. She hoped in God. She looked at that, and, and she would not be wrong for the equation to be, to, for what there to be included in this equation of evaluation about how she's going to submit to a leadership and say, okay, uh, this is twice now, and my husband, who's supposed to protect me, is so self-absorbed and concerned about getting hurt that he's now here I am in the palace again, totally unprotected. Sinful fear says, you hit panic button, you do everything you can to avoid this circumstance because he's not, Abraham's not going to protect you, you've got to protect yourself. Sarah says, there is no safer place to be than smack dab in the middle of God's will. Why did she submit to Abraham? Because she hoped in God. And when Abraham didn't protect her, God did, supernaturally. Even sovereignly through a man whose heart was not soft to God, but though maintained his own secular pagan level of integrity with Sarah, because uh, God was sovereignly protecting Sarah. So here, God is intervening, and God is sitting there saying, do what I've asked, submit to your husband. And she did so even when the leadership was bad, even when the leadership was self-absorbed, even when it's documentable that the motives were very poor, she trusted God. She had that much resolute faith that there's no safer place to be than in the smack dab in the middle of God's will. That's what she was thinking. And she said, okay, Lord, I'm in your hands. And God came through, as he always does. He protected her. When, and, and yes, Abraham failed. The point is, is that this is Sarah at her best. So, ladies, to kill fear, you need to 
confess what you're so sinfully scared of. It might even be helpful to take a piece of notebook paper some, some, some tonight or tomorrow morning or whenever you get a chance just to sit down with the Word of God and say, Lord, let me write down every circumstance, every relationship, every dynamic, everything that, could, that I'm afraid of, that are a temptation for fear to rise. The circumstances that I so desperately want to avoid, the circumstances that I so desperately want to guarantee regarding marriage or children, regarding finances, regarding health, regarding ministry in the church, regarding prominence, regarding er er earthly comforts, regarding no matter what. Write it out, put it on paper so you're staring, so it's staring you in the face, and then take that list and go to the Lord and confess your sin of not trusting Him in those circumstances. You need to repent of fearing um, as, if, as, if though, as though your, your concerns are better than God's concerns. If there's something that you're truly afraid of happening that God wants to bring into your life, you need to trust that that's actually for your best. There's no safer place to be than in God's will. And this may mean that you find yourself exposed without the natural, without the human leadership that you naturally crave. Well, just let God prove himself. Submit. If you walk in submission to him, he'll send angelic hosts to protect you, if need be. But you must cultivate the character of a gentle and quiet heart that trusts God. And you need to kill fear by repenting of doubt. Your doubt of God's character is so wicked, and until we're convinced by faith that we are safer submitting to God than to taking matters into our own hands, we will cultivate sinful fear rather than kill it. Well, next, we're going to take a quick break, and then we're going to look at killing anxiety. But let me just close in a word of prayer. Father, thank you for the example here of Sarah and the women of old. Thank you for the reminder for these ladies about how they adorn Christ. And in their role, they have such a unique ability to adorn Christ, um, especially if submission at times to the authorities that you've called us to submit to, if those authorities are ungodly. Um, uh, Even in the moment, they might be a a bad decision, according to your word, uh, or even uh, more tempting to fear would be those authorities that are characteristically not persuaded by your word. I just pray that you would and comfort these ladies, and particularly if there's any, any dynamics of the call to submit to authority that really um, is, exposes a real strong fear, I just pray that they would indeed bring that before you and do business in that area that they would not rest until they trust you to such a degree that they know that whatever you are bringing into their lives, that there's no safer place to be. There's no better place to be than in your will. You want what's best for us. You do care. Of course, Martha would doubt it. We would doubt it. And no doubt, every time we've ever complained against your providence, we have doubted your care of us. But Lord, that's a lie. We do, you, you do care for us. So strengthen our faith. And we pray that you would even use next hour to do that. In your name we pray. Amen.